Hello and welcome to another episode of Attacking Third, a CBS Sports Soccer Podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, lead NWSL writer for CBS Sports, joined today as always by my colleague and co-host, Lisa Roman, NWSL analyst and broadcaster. On today's episode, the NWSL has ratified the first CBA in women's soccer history, and we've got a special guest to join us on the Players Association to talk about it all. Merritt Mathias, been in NWSL since 2013, defender for the North Carolina Courage, and has helped work endlessly with the Players Association to come to an agreement on the CBA. Mary, welcome to the show. How are you doing? What's up, you guys? Thank you so much for having me. It's like such an honor to be here and celebrate this like historical moment with you guys. Uh, Anyone that's thrilled. just listening as a podcast and not watching on YouTube, um, Merritt was giving this like awesome celebratory dance as Sandra gave the intro. So <laughs> definitely head to our YouTube and watch this because the energy right now is yeah. fantastic. It's, it's historical. It's peak. It's peak, it's peak when, energy. When I say welcome to the show, it's a show. <laughs> I mean, I love it. Let's keep that energy going. Um, let's talk a little bit about maybe your play specifically, right? Uh, and all this in terms of the player association and this very historic thing that we're all here celebrating uh, first ever CBA in existence in this league in women's pro soccer in America, quite frankly. Can you believe uh, in it? Uh, it's a little, I'm a, listen, I'm thrilled uh, to be able to chat about this with you and, and any of the other players that we're going to be having on in the future here. Uh, but in terms of for, for you, for, for Merit, uh, what, to, how was your journey in terms of getting involved into the players association? Because I think when we're looking at a timeline of things, when we're talking about the historic, uh, you know, moments that take place, I mean, for the players association, we're talking getting founded in 2017, right? And then we're fast forwarding now into a 2021 off season, now in 2022 for CA, CBA. Uh, what was the trajectory like in terms of your involvement with the Players Association? Yeah, so, you know, I think first the, P, the PA came about, yeah, 2017. So, you know, we started the CBA negotiations. The first that we ever heard about it um, was 2020 in challenge in the challenge cup in salt lake and this um megan presented uh she was announced as our executive director and that we were going to go into bargaining with the league and this is um 2020 pandemic had hit um and at that time i was like this is awesome this is totally needed in the league um, but full transparency, like I was just not in a place in my personal life to like really take on much more. I was at basically max capacity and quite honestly, like my toes were bleeding from hitting the rocks at the bottom of <laughs> what we, like, so yeah, that's where I was in my life and kind of was like, this is awesome, but I trust, you know, the women and the people that we put into power to like go and handle this. This is, you know, we'll see what happens. And so fast forward a few months, um, I, we were in our 2021 season and I met with a really good friend of mine, um, Rachel Corsi, we played together in Seattle and she is now the um, vice president of the PA and have so much respect for Rach. And as we do, we went and got coffee um, after our game, like the next day before I flew out and we were just having just a candid conversation about where we were, you know, where the league was, where negotiations were. And, um, you know, I was just kind of giving as I do my opinion, which was probably unsolicited, but I was, we were talking back and forth and she just was like, Mayor, I like, I think it'd be really great for you to like join the, um, collective bargaining like committee and um would you be interested like we need someone like you with your voice with your experience and like I just think it'd be really great and I was like you know what like I'm in a place in my life like uh, yes I you know I, at some point like you can't sit here and have all these ideas and then like not step up to the plate and be like all right I'm willing to get involved and so um very quickly got in touch with like Megan Burke, who is our executive director and kind of got um, on the committee, the bargaining committee. And from there, just kind of like really just wanted to be a part of just the conversation and to listen and to hear where we were and kind of just give 
my experience and like my opinions on like what we should ask for, what are non-negotiables and like went from there. So I kind of quickly got involved and yeah, kind of fell in love with the process. It was just a really, um, as difficult and as like time consuming as it was, it was like really empowering. And you really, I think I really realized like how much of a passion I had for just like wanting to make this league better and knowing that it could be. Merit, for you, you've been involved and in the league uh, for the last nine seasons since the inception of the NWSL. And you mentioned once you joined and, and you got in touch with Megan Burke and you joined that CBA committee that you shared your experiences over the last nine seasons. What experiences were you keying in on that helped you in those CBA conversations? Um, I think if you have been in this league since its inception, it's there has been very slow progress in, in like there from where it was in 2013 to where we are in 2022, it is a different landscape. Um, but with that being said, there is definitely an overall consensus among players that the investment could be better. The belief that could be better. The pie that is you know, the possibility of the pie being grown for not only the players to, in order to make money, but also for this league to actually invest in it and make it something that we as players believe it can be. I think that that has come from just where this league started. And I started in Kansas City and we were, you know, to fly out to um Seattle took like two layover flights like we stopped in San Diego stopped in LA and then went to Seattle and I mean it was like I think an insane amount of travel hours and then was expected to play like the next day so you go from having these experiences I was also a part of the um, Seattle team that played on the posted side stamp in Western New York and you know, just all the tragedy that happens that has happened in this league and just the lack of having a standard and what that will eventually look like. And unfortunately, because we've had a lack of a standard, it falls on the players to kind of just deal with it and, you know, lace up and roll with the punches and be expected and grateful to have a league to play in. And, I think all of that combined in the past nine years and just being surrounded by truly impressive and remarkable women um, that you start to you start to know that you deserve better than this. And I think that all all the time that I've spent, you know, playing and traveling and practicing and being around you know, on being around and on different teams, it just provided me experience that was collectively like this can be better. And these are, these are the ways in which I believe it can be better. And then you kind of gain momentum because everyone's basically had that experience. Everyone's had some far out story. That's like, that should never happen as a professional athlete. That should never be something that you encounter. And so in that way, I think just the collection of experiences that people have gone through, especially if you've been in this league since 2013, that you're just kind of like, okay, it's been 10 years and we're going to ask for more because we deserve it. You know, with your, with your extensive experience here in the league, um, and looking at some of the details, right, of that came out of this CBA, but also looking at looking at these details in a lens where there are different points that are going to be started, like different steps that are going to be taking place throughout this. I mean, there was there's the concept of free agency, right? There's the concept concept of like contract terms. There's it's insane to think about, but the the fact that something like hey, we're not going to be playing on substandard pitches anymore is a thing that needs to be included in a CBA, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is there one thing in particular in this CBA that is most important for you personally, or that you feel connected to on a personal level that was a big victory? Um, well, I have two. I believe that having free agency is at the beginning of 2023 for the players that have had six years of service will be given unrestricted free agency. 
Um, you know, I think for the veteran players in this league that might not play for the entirety of the term of the CBA to give players back some autonomy over their career and, you know, as, as immediately as we could, um, and that has never been given to anyone in this league if you, ever. And to be able to give that back to players who have basically built this league, their own blood, sweat, sweat and tears and their sacrifice, I think that is huge. And as a player for, to have the, you know, to be out of contract next year and to have the ability to be a free agent, which I've never experienced in my playing career, is huge to just be able to like go out and see the market and invite a competitive, you know, environment between clubs and hopefully drive the market and drive salaries up. And I just think that is such a powerful thing. And I don't think in 2022 going into 2023, I don't believe you can be, or you can consider yourself a professional league if you don't have some form of free agency. And so to have that, um, and to give people the ability to have control over their careers is something that is just such a gift and it hasn't been given to so many players. And I hope, you know, it is something that players that have, that are veterans in this league are really cherish and are grateful for because yeah, it, it is kind of unimaginable. It's kind of just ridiculous that that's never been given to players. And to be fair, like in terms of it being six years and um, it being at the start of 2023, there are reasons behind that. And, and the reasons are hopefully that drives the market. If we were to do it in any other way, it would increase free agency. So it wouldn't have the benefit that we would hope. So in that way, I think that there's a balance and it allows definitely the players that have given a lot to this league to once again, have a choice in where they play next. And that's really exciting and creates excitement in the league. It creates like the ability to really like get to see where free agents go and what yeah. happens and to finally be like, Oh, you actually don't have my rights. I do like to have that for the first time is so incredibly monumental and I'm just so proud of that the second is um which you know kind of in the bigger scheme of things is like probably lower on the totem pole but yes the fact that we now have a standard for our fields and what we what is required by organizations to have and adhere to is huge and I think a lot of in like the NWSL and the league in general has, you know, succumbed to this thinking of like, we're just grateful that someone is willing to buy a team or someone's willing to be a part of the NWSL. And so when you have that, you kind of lose the ability to set a standard and what you allow to come in is a lack of a lack of a standard that is acceptable for the talent of women that is in this league. So And I think you saw that with, you know, Salt Lake City going back to Kansas City and, you know, it's a temporary thing and it's going to be okay. It's a baseball field. And honestly, the the parody of driving past the MLS stadium and then turning left into the minor league baseball stadium, I'm just like, this is not okay. And just out of just safety for players and the ability for like our talents to be showcased, you're not going to see that on a unregulated smaller field Mm -hmm. in which you have three different forms of turf and the turf is coming up when you kick a ball. It's just not good enough. And on top of that, I think this league is deserving of being put in the best environment in order for people to want to come and watch what is being put on the field and the product that's on the field and no fan, whether like the only fans that are showing up are either diehard fans or you have some type of personal relationship with someone on the field. No fan wants to watch a game through a net 50 yards away, trying to figure out where the ball is and watching a product that just is 
significantly reduced because of what you're required to play on. And for me as a player, when this issue came up and you would be surprised how much pushback and how long it took to get this to be agreed to. And when it came up, I basically told Megan, we were on a call and I was just like, listen, it's year 10. We're going into year 10 of this league. If people want to come into this league, there's a standard that we are going to uphold that players deserve. And in doing so, it allows the product to be shown in the way that it's supposed to be shown and keeps players safe. But we can no longer allow for temporary things to be long periods of time, seasons on seasons. And I'm like, that's great if someone wants to come into the league. And we are not asking you to go build a multi-million dollar stadium and have it all sorted. All we're asking is that we have a soccer specific field and pitch to play on that is within FIFA regulations that is safe for the time which you get things sorted. And if you can't do that, sell the team. You're not welcome here. We'll find someone else. And I think that is where we have, to, that is where I hope that the CBA starts to turn over, that it's no longer from a place of like, oh, we're so grateful. It's from a place of like, we're betting on ourselves. This should be better. This is the standard. If you want to be a part of it, this is where you have to, this is the level in which you have to invest. And if you can do that, great. If you can't, we'll see you in a couple of years. As a former player myself and a broadcaster in the NWSL, I think um, when I read these terms, having standard field size was one of the things that stuck out to me. And it, my first reaction was, why was this not already in place? But as you mentioned, it wasn't the norm. There wasn't a standard benchmark that was mandated in the league and to get a standard size field that is <laughs> normal turf or grass, whatever it may be, will elevate the level of play overall. will elevate the fans. As you mentioned coming, it'll elevate the broadcast because broadcasters will be able to see a little bit better uh, than the screens. There's so many different levels of this um, and you touched on so many of them, but Mary, you talked about honoring the veterans in the league and the players that came before you in the NWSL and in all the other professional leagues in the United States. At the end of the Players Association statement, it said um, to the players that came before us, we stand on your shoulders and we hope to make you proud. Those players and, and all of the veterans and all of the retired players, have you had a chance to talk to any of them? I know a lot of them are still involved, but have you had a chance to talk to them or, or what would you say to them in terms of this historic CBA? Um. I haven't had a chance to speak to a lot of veteran players or um, players that have come before, more specifically players that have been in this league before us or in the WPS. And, um, but I have spoken to some of the veteran players in this league and just like the amount of appreciation that is been just outpouring and just how grateful people are to have, you know, to know that, they've been fought for and that they've been heard and that there is change and that they can once again, feel proud to play for the NWSL or start to, um, I think is really important, but to all the people that, to all the players and all the women that came before us, I mean, there are so many women that are no longer playing that shaped who I am as a player and helped shape my career. And, you know, put took me under their wing and just like brought me up and allowed me to be myself and to play this game that I love and for that I'm just forever grateful and you know in so many ways have kind of laid the path for just being like this is what is right and this is what is not right and we might not have the power now to change it but I'm gonna stand up for what I believe in and what I know to be right and I mean when I speak, I think of like Lauren Cheney, who was um, my teammate, my first and second year in Kansas City. And the amount of times she just like went to bat for us because she's like, this is not right. This is not, this is below a standard. And I'm willing to stick my neck out because I can and I have the power to. I think just to watch her lead in such a way and like to really just always fight for the greater good and know that like 
we as women are deserving. I think that really stuck with me for a long time. And I, I don't, don't think I realized the impact of that until like I was much older and a bit more mature, but yeah, I think like just having people like that, that were like, yeah, this isn't good enough. And it might not change right now, but I'm willing to like bet that bet on myself and know the power in which we have as a collective to keep moving forward. And, um, and I know that Lauren is like so many other players that came before me that did that on a regular basis. And this league wouldn't be here if it weren't for players like her. So we are so, so thankful. You know, that, that concept of like betting on oneself, I, I don't know if folks out there understand like how kind of scary of a place that can be sometimes, you know, and we can maybe even sort of center this in on, on this last week or so specifically for the players association, you know, we are talking a week out, right. Seven days before preseason is set to start the <laughs> players association, putting out a statement alluding to, you know, Hey, if there's not a contract in place, not going to report to preseason. And again, I just don't, I'm not sure if listeners out there or, or our viewers understand like, um, how maybe kind of uh, scary of a decision that can, that can, uh, you know, be, and I would assume that that type of decision isn't easy to come to, uh, you know, it could be perceived as almost like a threat, right. To, to, to board members and stuff like that, where they're, in terms of um, rallying everybody together, so to speak, were there nerves about putting together that plan of action in place? Should things go one way versus the celebratory way that we know now? Um. Of course, I think whenever you're, you know, there's talks of withholding services, there's, there's the rational side that's like, oh, yes, this makes so much sense. And that's where our power lies. And then the, you know, the voice in your head that's like, oh, wait, but what about getting paid? And what about housing? And what about all these logistical things? And it's like, what is the balance of what you're willing to sacrifice? And I will say that I don't believe that we would have the CBA that we have and be here celebrating the way that we did if this league did not go what it went through with the release of Mana and Sinead's story. And I think through all the pain and all the hurt and just everything that was experienced by players just across this league, whether you knew them personally or did not know them or had your own experience or knew someone with a similar experience I think what it did for this league of women is it galvanized us and it made it very clear that things needed to change and they needed to be better and we were deserving of such and so as these conversations went on and, you know, we were getting closer to preseason starting and getting all these phone calls and being like, here, there's a real possibility that this could be the way that this pans out. And these are the reasons why. And these are the sticking points that as a bargaining committee, we believe that if we step on the field on February 1st, we will give up our power and to step on the field would be a disservice. And we're not willing to do so. And I, and I know that there was fear amongst the group, which there always, there should be when it comes to that decision. But I believe as a collective, people were willing to stand strong. And it was because of just also Megan Burke's work and our lawyers like Deb, Jess, and Larry, their ability to kind of one, give the players a voice for them to go negotiate, but also to kind of reinforce this idea of like, we're not blinking. We're going to bet on yourselves. You deserve this. And to, you know, give that power to us as a bargaining committee to then go and give that to a team or speak to it as a collective and on these Zoom calls. I think you know, it it would have been, it would have been a hard decision and it would have not been the one that we wanted because we wanted to get a contract. That's what all this was for. But there was a point in time where it was like, okay, well to get that contract means we will threaten this and it is worth it because we, as 
the women of the NWSL refused to go through another season like 2021 because it was horrific and no one should experience that. And people should be proud to play in this league and put on a Jersey. And for, I, I, for some time, I don't believe players felt that way. And it was, you could just see, you could just tell. And so I think without that moment, I don't know if we get this moment. And I, I am so proud to be here and to have been part of it, but I know that it came from a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. You know, just to follow up on that a little bit, you know, that mid to late season in 2021 was really uh, sort of what we've been referring to in the mean, the media is a bit of a reckoning, right. For, for the leaguers, that was perhaps the perception of what was uh, going on, whether it was things involving specific clubs like the thorns or spirit or, or courage, um, and all of that coming to light and all these sort of stories coming to the forefront and all of this happening in the middle of these ongoing CBA negotiations. And you're right, it's horrific. And I think even on our end of things, it was incredibly tough to cover, uh, as media and to, to write content around to try to continue to help tell that story as honestly and respectfully as possible. Um, and then to sort of see how things started to maybe transform a little bit into where you're having these CBA negotiations, right? And you're thinking, yeah, we're going to maybe have a set plan of things like you mentioned, uh, some certain demands that we'd like to be met. And then all of a the sudden, these concepts, not even concepts, these simple things that you would think would already be uh, pillars of the league, like player safety, <laughs> not abusive environments, mm -hmm. not toxic environments, you know, that these things would just be a standard already here. And so it started to sort of not maybe shit, but sort of started to sort of felt like the CBA negotiation started to include and mean something much, much bigger than just perhaps ensuring that there was something like a free agency market in place. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe walk us through sort of the shift of, hey, we have a set of bullet points to go through versus like player safety is now number one. And now we're going to be fighting for all of these things collectively. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to start at, like take it a little bit back and then like yeah. move forward. But um, I don't know if you guys have, or people that are listening have read the book Atomic Habits by James Clear, but in it, he, there's a quote and I might butcher it a bit, but it basically says like, we don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our processes. And I believe that what we saw happen in 2021, didn't just all of a sudden happen. It was a series of decisions that the NWSL and the league just continuously put into place that then created what happened, the reckoning of 2021. And I think when you see, you know, minimum salary and the lack of free agency and making people play, making women play on baseball fields and, you know, maintaining the decision to maintain power and to protect predators and to hire predators and all these things. Those little decisions, those little things that they are part of the system. And you're not going to rise to this goal of wanting to be the best league in the world. You're just not, you're not going to do it when your decisions along all of these years have been like, we're going to continue to unilaterally do it this way. And this is the way it's going to be done. And so to bring you to this point, I think with the CBA, I believe, and I'm hopeful that this contract brings a level of a standard that makes the people of the league and empower and organizations that are a part and will become a part of this league have to make decisions that align with wanting to be the greatest women's professional like league in the world. And you don't get that without the voices of these women. And you don't get that without the women believing in themselves and wanting to play here and wanting to sacrifice you don't get there without them. And so I think with the CBA and everything that happened, 
and hearing the stories that just kind of just flooded out, it became very, very clear and blatant that player safety was at the forefront. And in order to do that, that in, intangibly meant like um, minimum salaries need to be raised. Free agency needs to be a thing that like people can live in housing that they want to, or all, you have healthcare benefits. They can have a mental, like, um, um, I'm blanking on the word, like uh, mental, six health months mental health, health right? Yes. And yeah. so important and severance pay. If you get waived, yeah. like start uh, yeah. protecting people as people start giving us as women, what you would get on a like standard basis on any other platform in a working environment. So I think in that way, it was just like, after everything that happened, it's like the women of this league deserve more than what they have gotten. And we are going to stand firm in our ask and stand firm in that, like you will in some way give us what we're asking for. It might not be exactly the way that we want it. We might not get revenue share exactly the way that we want it, but like, we're going to have our foot in the door and it's going to be a conversation. And we are going to, as a PA, start to demand more transparency and start to ask better of you as owners, as a league, because you haven't had to in the past nine years. And so um, I just think I, you know, I am love Brene Brown. She's like my honestly like idol. And um, she always is talking about, you know, like you don't get like organizations that are transparent and curious and care and all of these things without like having to sacrifice some of what they've done in, in before. So like, I think the NWSL in so many ways has, you know, wanted to protect power in organizations that brought in money and there was a lack of transparency and a lack of care for the women that played here. And so I just am hopeful that having something in writing such as the CBA will you know, hold people accountable. Mary, you touched on on the nerves and the emotions uh, one week ago when the, the PA put out that statement um, stating your demands and really the timeline and everything that has come forth of it. And, and we're recording this on Tuesday evening, February 1st. So about 24 hours ago, um, mm -hmm. the statement was released that there was a CBA and that the players would report to preseason walk me through your emotions over the last 24 hours when, when the statement went out, when um, it, it was made public that there would be a CBA. Um, so we, as a all player call um, as a collective, we were on a call last night. I think, I believe it started at six 30 and, um, and basically Megan announced that we had, finalize the CBA that we finally had one. And I think for me, I was like, I've been a part of these conversations and I'm like, you know, it's been so up and down and a few weeks ago, it's like preparing, like, what does it look like to pair, prepare for a strike and not start on February 1st and, and being kind of like in a bad mood about it. I'm like, this, like, I'm not showing up for preseason if we don't have a CBA and what does that all look like? And, you know, kind of honestly not being very hopeful, like not hopeful that we were going to get a deal done in the, in the timeline that we had. And, um, and just sitting with that. And it's been really funny to have gotten that message last night from Megan and, um, to kind of, as the players like logged off and I mean, just an overwhelming amount of messages were sent and just how grateful and thankful people were and just so proud and just feel like they were heard and they feel safe and protected and excited to like go into preseason now. Um, for me, I, it's been so relieving to realize how quickly I can sit in a space of like being proud and empowered and 
a feeling of accomplishment. It's like a very historical thing to be a part of. And I'm so grateful. So today, like going, waking up and like starting preseason, I was like, oh my God, I feel like I can breathe easier. I feel like just excited. I feel in a, in a space where I'm finally excited to play again. And I think that comes off the back of just being in uncertainty for two years now. Like we haven't had a normal season for two years. We've gone through, for me, it was one of the hardest seasons I've ever been through. One for like coming back from injury and two, just the onslaught of just tragic things that happened. It was really hard to get through 2021. And so to step onto the field today, just like feeling hopeful and excited and to know that we've accomplished something so historic for women's soccer. Um, it's an incredible feeling. And I'm just so honored to have worked alongside such inspiring and capable women, which I always knew were in this league, but to see it firsthand, I mean, it is just something really special. Mary, you're giving me chills. <laughs> yeah, same. I'm just like over here nodding like, yes. This is it. And, you know what it's, and we're all still sort of, you know, like Lisa had mentioned at, at our time of recording this, is we're still very much in the beginning stages of this, right? The celebratory stages of this. And yeah, um, a lot of the reaction that came out once this was all coming out throughout the duration of the evening was that celebratory sort of reaction to it. Um, and sort of seeing everyone in all different areas of the space, whether it's, it was the players or, you know, coaches or, or the, the league uh, front office and uh, those of us in, in the media just sort of responding to it and reacting to it in kind of real time. I mean, there was almost a moment, it was a mixed bag. It was a lot of joy. Like we've been talking a lot on this episode, even some moments of sadness when you take the time to reflect on the things that happen in order to get here. Uh, so when, with that, perhaps even a sense of, of relief, you know? So yeah. in terms of keeping in, in line with sort of the, the celebratory kind of moods and, and, and all of this, these processes sort of having to be done virtually over Zoom, what is the thing that you would like to do perhaps to, to mark the occasion and celebrate now that you're sort of, you know, in person with some of your teammates? Oh my gosh. Well, today we ran the 3015 test. So I don't know if that <laughs> is like in some way, some messed up form of celebration oh but um no I think it's just I think just like sitting in the moment and like really not push not just like moving on to the next thing I think that has become like such a intentional thing that I want to do in my life you know as a professional athlete you often are like you know we've accomplished this, we won this championship, you have this accolade, and it always comes with like, what is next? I, this is now what I have to achieve. This is now the standard that I have to uphold. This is now, you know, I did this now, what more can I do? And what you often find is that like, you're always searching for something. It never feels like you're not completed by it. It's always just like, that was great time to move on and like, do the next thing, prepare for the next thing. And I think this moment is one of those moments where it's like, don't move on too quick, like sit with this, really just enjoy it and like take in what you've been a part of, because I don't know how many people get the opportunity to be a part of something like this and to feel like you are helping the greater good that you fought for the greater good. I personally have never experienced this before. And I, it is a completely new feeling. And, um, I just feel overwhelmingly proud of just the women of this league and just so grateful to be a part of just this family that was created on the bargaining committee and just like this connection and bond that's, you know, been, created through like zoom like I haven't met any of the like not many of these people have I met in person talking about like our legal counsel and stuff and to just have like this bond with them is is really incredible so I think for me it's just like really um embracing the moment and sticking with it and not moving on too fast and like really kind of rejoicing in like what has been done I love that. That's a good energy, I think, to have and take into this upcoming season and take into the next 
five years, right? Of this, yeah. of this CBA and, uh, you know, just taking a cue from the players association and reckon, uh, recognizing all the players in the past who, who fought for something similar. And even recently with, um, with everything that happened in 2021 and whether it was Kaya McCullough or Sinead Farrelly or, uh, or Manishim. So I yeah. uh, want to thank you for your time with us, Mary. We appreciate everything that you've been sharing with us and by extension, our listeners. I always like to thank our listeners for joining us. So thank you listeners for uh, really being on this ride with us. We've had several interviews with Megan Burke and other <laughs> players representing the association. So it's great to sort of um, have these types of conversations now that everything has uh, come to fruition. So thank you everyone for listening. If you've enjoyed what you heard, follow us on Twitter at attacking third. You can leave us a rating on Apple podcasts or Spotify and listen to us on all of those great outlets as well. And we'll be back with more coverage of CBA celebrations, <laughs> no longer negotiations for Sandra Herrera, Lisa Roman, Mayor Matthias, as well as attacking third. Thank you.